Welcome to Classical Ideas. This is Greg Soden. Throughout this show, the San Francisco, California Buddhist community has appeared again and again in an interesting subplot to the show. Early on, I interviewed Anne and Joan Watts, the two eldest daughters of Alan Watts. Later, I talked to Michael Downing about his famous book, Shoes Outside the Door, about the San Francisco Zen Center and the teachings of Shunryu Suzuki Roshi. Later on, I spoke to Zenju Earthland Manuel about her work and teaching through San Francisco Zen Center's community. That thread of California Buddhism continues on this episode with Gary Gok, an author, teacher, poet, and Buddhist with years of studying Buddhism, Kabbalah, and Hasidism under his belt. Among his bibliography is Complete Idiot's Guide to Understanding Buddhism, now in its third edition and with over 100,000 copies sold. Gary has been such a fantastic friend to the podcast over the past few years. He's been a frequent listener, and he has been an inspiring source of feedback for me as I've gone through doing this show. It is truly a pleasure to have Gary Gock on the show to discuss his intriguing and winding road of spiritual practice, Buddhism, his writing, poetry, and the state of the world today. You can find Gary online at GaryGock.com and on Twitter at NoBodhi, spelled N-O-B-O-D-H-I. This was a much-needed conversation for me on a day when we recorded when I wasn't really feeling all that great about life, so thank you so much, Gary, for this heartfelt conversation. It truly means a lot. So without further delay, please enjoy my conversation with Gary Gock. Gary Gock, welcome to Classical Ideas. Glad to be here. It's been a long time coming, Gary, having you on the show, and I'm delighted that we're finally able to do this. And to start us off, I'd like you to, uh, you know, I invite you to start off the show in a very particular way. So if you want to tell the audience what you're going to do and how we're going to start off today, I would be delighted to have you do that. Perfect. Well, I thought that since you and I are coming from different points in our day and different time zones and different spaces, and the listeners are too, as they're gathering to our your podcast Um, that I'd invite us all to arrive together in the present moment. And the way I'd like to do this is to invite a bell, uh, which we can just be with. You just, if you've never done this before, you can close your eyes, be aware of your breathing, and your breath is in the present moment, and the bell is an extra reminder. And just listening and being with the sound of the bell allowing our body and mind to arrive together in the present moment. I love the the way that it draws out and how there's so much life left in the ring so mm. so for so long after it's been struck and it just goes to show you the the changing dynamic nature of every single moment that passes before us <laughs> if you have your senses attuned do you know what I mean senses attuned yeah so that's that's good i like that so just to dot the i um if I don't know if you've ever done this in class, say with your students, but I notice, for example, if I'm reading a book and I stop and I, an imaginary bell is rung and I, I return to my breathing and then I'm, I return to the object of my consciousness, like the interview or the book or washing the dishes. And I'm doing it with my awareness of my breathing, which is to say my awareness, then I'm able to, um, be more fully engaged with it, I find. So I'd like to invite myself to remember to breathe. 
and to invite the listeners as they're listening to um, kind of just being with their awareness in their breath while they're listening so that they have more, I guess, what, autonomy? <laughs> mm. I don't know. Yeah, you I know. love it. Well, okay. Gary, um, you know, a lot of folks out there listening uh, may not know you and your, you know, tremendous body of work that you've put together over the years. Can you just sort of spend a moment and introduce yourself to the audience, however you see fit, so they can get a context for who you are and what you do? Sure, sure. Um, my name is Gary Gach. That's my website, garygach.com, G-A-C-H. And you can always look up stuff there. And for the past um, dozen years, I was hosting a, a Zen Mindfulness Fellowship weekly at Aquatic Park Center, where we practice Zen mindfulness. Uh, in the room, we do walking meditation to the sound of the waves outdoors until uh, the lockdown. San Francisco is the first city to lockdown. And um, now I'm kind of experiencing uh, what it's like to find other people via Zoom. Um, in my past, I've written various things, uh, nine books and a couple hundred magazine journals, anthologies, which has been part of my practice, you know, since I was 10. And um, here I am. <laughs> Excellent. Well, you know, you're you're well you're well known for your writings within Buddhist and Zen traditions, but I know that you have uh, a significantly more complex spiritual background, from what I know about you, uh, that led you to that point. Is there a way that you can like sort of trace your 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 own spiritual stepping stones throughout the course of your life before you found uh, the Buddhist practice that sort of has sustained you for the past, you know, many years? <laughs> yeah, right. 50, 60 years. Yeah. Actually, uh, I kind I, it's a good question. And as it turns out, Buddhism is my first practice. And I'll tell you how, because it answers the question. Mm -hmm. um, my background. Um, I was eight in Los Angeles in school, and the teacher had finished uh, the the lesson. Was doing busy work, and the busy work, you know, make busy was like, yeah. said, raise your left hand. <laughs> and we all raised our left hand. She looked to see if we were. She pointed people who raise your right hand, and we did. Put your hand down. Now raise your right hand. And it was like this, I looked at her and I said, this is a, a name kind of look. And I just, I'm not doing it, you know, you bust me. I don't care. And I just looked out the window and there's been a house under construction for several weeks. And I'd been aware of it and the sounds, but I really looked at it in a way you could say, I looked deeply mm. in a way that for me to put into words is to unpack something that happened like in the tick of an artery, just in a, there's a Hebrew word for it, Shazam. Mm. And it goes something like this. I'm, I'm seeing uh, the trees in Los Angeles that are just radiating the sun off of their leaves. And the sun is shining through this house and illuminating the wood, which is cut from trees which was illuminated, grown by the sun and the workers looking at a blueprint, which is made paper from trees. Uh, somebody sipping coffee that was grown when the sun by and made maybe and put in the thermos was put in the lunch pail by the wife who gave the, that worker breakfast, which was grown by the sun. And I just, my mind is looking at all of these things and seeing their interconnections, mm -hmm. wood, sun, human beings, birds. And in that instant, the leap uh, of my mind was, if I'm seeing these patterns and they're all interconnected, is there a pattern to this? And I said, yes, there is, <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> Eureka. 
And then, you know, the bell rang and I left. You know, and, um, it wasn't until two years later or three, I guess, that I understood this as Buddhism or that rather, well, here's what happened. I, my grandfather had me go to the corner store to buy cigars, which I would do and spend my allowance on comic books. And I looked at the books on the paperback spinner and for 35 cents, <laughs> 35 cents, there was this bronze background, uh, Zen kind of lettering, picture of a Buddha. It said the way of Zen. And the author's name was also catchy, Alan Watts. Yes. Two T's, Alan Watts. So 35 cents, you know, what's to lose? And I took it home. And I can't remember the night exactly, but I remember it's like the third time I'm opening the book, page 37, there it is, what I saw. And in Buddhism, there's a Sanskrit name and it's shortened by a neologism that the Vietnamese Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh calls interbeing, right? It's just the unimpeded interconnection and of all things. It's like, just like that. It's like everything's all connected and interconnected and you can't separate one thing from anything else because it's all, everything's all a twingled. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nice. And so I saw that in the book and I said, Oh, you know, I, I haven't heard this in, in Judaism. It does. I have certainly haven't heard it in Christianity but right now, in this moment, this is like telling me how I vibrate with the universe, because I've experienced mm -hmm. this for myself. And so I, I think I should learn more about the Buddha, because I seem to resonate with this path. Mm. And um, when I, uh, you know, learned Hebrew for bar mitzvah as, as a Jew, uh, it you know, I, I absorbed a lot of stuff, but they never were talking about any of this stuff, which wasn't talked about until, uh, you know, like historically, which is where I'm positioning this, um, the idea of Jewish renewal, where Jewish mysticism could be taught again, mm -hmm. was just sort of emerging. And had I heard it, you know, when I was 10, maybe I would have just followed the Jewish path and become a chassid or something, which I later did mm. when I met a, a Hasidic rabbi who was like the 18th in his lineage, a very beautiful community. And I went, aha, oh, this is Judaism. I get it. It's not just about, you know, learning Hebrew. It's And, and he was just this gifted teacher. And I find Hasidism and, and Zen and Sufism, very similar. And, and to this day, I'm just very comfortable with all of those and indigenous wisdom with those kind of traditions, but I've had the most footprints, mm. you know, in, in Buddhism. Oh, that's so interesting. I like it when people, uh, mm. you know, explore far and wide, because to me, that's a mark of a, a, a heavily lived life. You know what I oh. mean? Where you mm. want to see the expansive nature of what's available in our lives within this lifespan that we have instead of being like all in right away on one thing. I just love that. But some of the things I that hadn't you, thought of it that way. Ah, yeah. And it, it's just as it, it's, it's the reason I do this show. It's the oh. reason I teach about religions and philosophy with uh, high school students. It's oh. just something that's endlessly intrinsically motivating to me and wow. i just love the stories of how people have traversed their lives and to me like learning about religion is like learning about human biographies and it's mm. just a a well of information mm. and experience that i don't think i'll ever completely satiate you know what i no, mean like there's no. there's endless amounts of stories yeah, of people's lived lives that you can learn. Absolutely. But, I mean, your story overlaps, as you said, with Alan Watts. And one of my favorite experiences that I had on this show was that I got to talk to Joan Watts yeah. and Ann Watts, who are yeah. Alan Watts's two eldest children. Um, I also talked about 
uh, talk to Michael Downing about his book, Shoes Outside the Door, which is about yeah. the San Francisco Zen Center and Shinryu Suzuki Roshi. And so you're sort of like inextricably woven throughout some of the things that I've been exploring on this show for the last three years, you know? And so I'm curious about how your immersion into like the California Western Zen scene sort of took place in the 1960s. Cause I know that your, your path overlapped a little bit with Watts overlapped a little bit with Suzuki Roshi. Can you talk a little bit about that scene in which you were, um, you know, firmly starting to really start, start your practice up for real? Mm, what a great question. And I'll, <laughs> try not to make it the focus of the whole show because I could. <laughs> um, and inextricably woven. I love that. I think that's Martin Luther King, isn't it? I don't know. Yeah. In in we are inextricably woven in a web of mutuality. Oh, I, yeah. And I'm definitely not like uh, coming up with that my, myself. So I, that, I came across that for sure somewhere and it's just lodged into my, into my mind. I'm just still, I'm just kind of tripping on the interbeing thread of our conversation. Oh, for and, sure. And yeah. You're now, now I believe we're in, I'm invited to do a little interbeing with others. Right? Yeah. Well, like, and so San I Francisco met Alan Watts finally yeah. because a, 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 a friend of mine that I grew up with is uh, living. Uh, no, his girlfriend lived on the same houseboat mm. and, um, you know, I, I kind of, <laughs> you know prostrated at his feet politely and he was a very polite guy and he, and he uh, we, we crossed paths enough eventually he invited me to his home you know which gosh you know i can't begin to tell you what that was like to have this beautiful teacher um with all of his flaws mm -hmm. um let me into his life because he'd already been part of my life. And I think what you, when you say that I'm part of this, you know, what the, what is that I I'm hearing you're referring to is what Rick Fields called uh, the, how the swans came to the lake the, the, in his wonderful narrative cornerstone groundbreaking book on Buddhism coming to the West. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And, so from the uh, the ten year old who like tucked this little piece of gold in his clock pocket in his jeans so it wouldn't mix with the other coins, um, there's this kind of long process of watching the swans coming to the lake because there were more, as Downing said in his book, uh, there were more Buddhists behind glass cases in museums than there were people teaching other people mm. as Buddhas. And so I remember uh, Paul Reps, whose wonderful book, Zen Telegrams, I had fallen in love with, came to town for a talk on Sunset Boulevard at some small shop. And, you know, it was very encouraging as I found out he was to others, although he never, he just was kind of this wandering saint, Paul Reps. Um, he co-wrote Zen, Zen Flesh, Zen Bones with Nyojin Senzaki. And, um, but there weren't any Zen centers, you know? Right. <laughs> Suzuki Roshi started the first Zen center, like, across the street from where I was living, while I was still very much immersed in, in this Hasidism uh, community. But I was aware, oh, Zen is, is across the street from me now. And, and there were this period of like holy men, you know, that are becoming prominent in the culture in general, um, because I think that's what a lot of the culture of the 60s was about, to my way of seeing, that it was a spiritual uh, reevaluation of, of, our, of our traditions. Mm. And so, you know, I saw all these, you know, <laughs> great spiritual teachers from different traditions. And uh, my criterion was always, did I feel warmth as well as light? Because they all seem to have light, mm -hmm. <laughs> undeniably. 
but did I really feel like, you know, I could get intimate and, and you know, vulnerable with them? Um, Katagiri Roshi was a uh, kamikaze pilot who became a Zen uh, teacher, a master. He taught me uh, how to sit. After Paul Rupchat, he actually physically refined it. It's something in Zen. It's called just sitting. It's where you're not meditating. You're just sitting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because, you know, that's what the Buddha did. He just sat. He wasn't trying to, he gave up. He was just sitting. And um, when I met Suzuki Roshi, it was like, I'll tell you that everything around him vanished. There were just these two eyes that were very bemused. Like, hmm, interesting. And he was a wonderful man, a wonderful teacher. Um, for me, uh, since that's, you know, nominally the subject of the thread of this uh, point of the podcast is when I met the Zen master, Nhat Han from Vietnam, that I said, ah, I feel at home. Mm -hmm. and I just felt the warmth that I'd been looking for as well as, you know, the light and, um, so I, I made that my root practice, sort of like I knew this would be my trunk and would continue to be aware of branches of things of somatics, you know, gestalt therapy and mm -hmm. all these other things that are emerging. And I'm very glad um, that it's worked out um, because... Um, I used to think of myself as a writer who was interested in Buddhism and now as a Buddhist for whom writing is part of my practice. It kind of unifies everything. Mm. And, you know, unification is, you know, the Jewish ideal, right? Of uh, uh, every, Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. You know, it, it's, it's one, it's not, it's several different idols. It's all, this is all one life, one planet, one experience, one God, if, if you were speaking it in terms of polytheism or monotheism. So it was a good question. So your root <laughs> practice, yeah, so it's fine. So your root practice is uh, based on the teachings of Thich Nhat Hanh, right? Well, my root practice is, you know, it, it's Buddhism, and you could also call it mindfulness if you call mindfulness what he originally was teaching it. I think. How um, did um how did Thich Nhat Hanh's uh, work and teaching come into your life? Uh, it's an, he's an he's a whole other you know hour too. Um, <laughs> you know he um, he first was teaching in exile in France. And I knew people who had gone to, to study with him. And in those days, you know, he, he had a monastery of uh, uh, monks and nuns and uh, some lay people, and it's very small. And he started um, visiting the United States and I caught him on the second visit. Um, and he had just beginning to go uh, horizontally wider, ex more expansive in terms of how he would bring Vietnamese Buddhism to to the world, rather than it coming to him. He was traveling, and I met him. I think on the second trip, and um, I was let's see. So at that point, I started practicing with his community here in the Bay Area. And I uh, wanted to donate <laughs> something. And I spent five years creating an anthology of um, Buddhist inflected modern poetry, which his press published. Mm. And so when he'd come to the United States, he'd also, besides giving a talk and a retreat, he'd also be at the publishing house. Nice. You know, so I got to know him also through the, the, the publishing Sangha the publishing community. Um, he's a very shy human being, which people don't always realize because he, you know, he has 
followers in the thousands and tens of thousands. But he's kind of the opposite of the Dalai Lama in terms of personality. He's very shy. Um, he rarely does the Zen one-on-one. -on -one. Here's your koan. Mm -hmm. Come and, and, you know, and, or you have one-on-one -on -one and the teacher says something kind of irrelevant. And yeah. you go back and you go, okay, <laughs> what does that mean? Um, um, and yet he, I don't know. He, he appear as I know his community very well, he appears face to face with people who need to see him face to face mm -hmm. when they need to see him face to face. It's just like that. Mm. Um, and that's been true in my life many times. Um, and I developed this <laughs> weird affinity when he gave a retreat once. I knew he'd be coming, that he was down the hall. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I, I would stand up because the door was about to open rather than mm -hmm. the door would open and everybody stands up. <laughs> Crazy, I know, but. I love it. He's a remarkable teacher, um, and I've recently written, been asked to write a couple of things about um, about that. You know, what is what what was it like to have him as a teacher? And I'm I'll happy to share it with the listeners. You know, when they get published, like they'll be on my website. Yeah, nice. Well, Thich Nhat Hanh came up recently on another episode of this show where oh. Andrea Miller, who's an editor at oh, Lions yeah. Roar, yeah, she yeah. has she has three chapters in her in her new book collection about going on a retreat with Thich Nhat Hanh. So that's another little thread that is uh, that I'm seeing recently coming from from episode to episode on the show, and I just love things like that. I, I well, nerd out. <laughs> be before we go on next. To the next. I just want to say that, you know, Lion's Roar, which is part of Shambhala Publications, mm -hmm. has done a great service to people who are interested in Thich Nhat Hanh, not only by publishing this book, but Melvin McLeod, the uh, senior editor of, of Lion's Roar then, um, did what at this point late in his career, Thich Nhat Hanh said, which was that if you want to get into an article about me or anything, why don't you come and live with my community for a week and we'll talk? Because mm -hmm. <laughs> he was tired of these people who were like helicopter in and helicopter out. And Melvin did that. Yeah. And so there's a book called You Are Here, which is a really marvelous introductory book for uh, people who are not familiar with Thich Nhat Hanh uh, in his later kind of years because a lot of people have read the introductory books from his early years. You Are Here is just this marvelous introduction, thanks to the Lion's Roar community, Andrew Miller and uh, Melvin McLeod, um, Shambhala. That's the uh, the little slim yellow cover paperback, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, right. That's uh... yeah, ask where it by the ask where, you know, I worked in a bookstore for eight years and that's what people would do. I, I love for... that. You know, yellow cover. Oh, it's right. Yeah, I um in my one of my last sanghas that I was a part of uh, in Columbia, Missouri. That was one of the last books I read with that oh. group before I moved. And so oh. that just boom, that just hit me right off the bat. I was like, oh, yeah, that's the book that we read back over there. at show me Dharma in Missouri. Fantastic. Talk about nerdy. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, speaking of books, um, uh. you recently sent me a copy of a big, beautiful book that you wrote and put together called An Idiot's Guide to Buddhism, which is uh, very popular. Um, you have multiple editions, and it's fantastic. I've been leafing through it for the past 10 days or so. And I, I love the way that you have put this book together and writing a book like this is no easy task because there's so it's so expansive yeah. and across so much history and uh, tries to encapsulate so many teachings and concepts and tries to make it accessible and practical for for everyday people living here and now. And I'm wondering what latched you into the idea of doing a book like this, uh, this guide to Buddhism with its expansiveness and its uh, tremendous mm. depth. 
Hmm. Wow. Um, I think it's the first time anybody's asked me against I've always, and it's a question I've always wanted to be asked. So let me give you, um, let me offer the middle length version. Sure. Okay. Um, when um, the idiots books came out, you know, the for dummies and yeah, for yeah, idiots yeah. is because it was the computers were just becoming popular PCs, personal computers. And the, they took the motto from the Volkswagen repair manual because uh, Volkswagen repair makes idiots of us all. And they call this, you know, the for dummies books. And they were all about, you know, DOS for dummies and windows for dummies. And they were very popular. So they not, they expanded their turf and they started doing all these other titles, <laughs> you know, sex for dummies. Mm -hmm. You go, wow, is that counterintuitive? But no, it was written by <laughs> Dr. Ruth. They were getting really serious authors to write, you know, very good, you know, uh, ABCs of something. Absolutely. In a, in a variety of titles. It was this great publishing phenomenon. And I um, said, gee, what if there were one on Buddhism? That's just, that was it. And Because I, I realized, you know, if you had the Harper Collins book on Buddhism or what is Buddhism, it wouldn't be the same. I was catching the wind of this phenomena in its sales. And just at the time when they started doing religion, they did one on Catholicism. Mm -hmm. The one on Islam started selling really well. Who would have thunk it, right? Mm -hmm. And so I proposed Buddhism and it became very popular in their religion series. I was very uh, grateful. And there's there were two interesting phenomena about it that you might get a kick out of. One is that these books, if you've seen them, they're very structured. They're like, they have so many chapters and every chapters have so many sub chapters and you have subheads and sub subheads. And then you have these little things in the margin where you can doodle in the margin, these definitions or comments and this learning how to write for them was this like indoctrination. It was really fascinating. But what was interesting about that was a lot of that intersects the way the teachings of the Buddha are presented as numbered lists, mm -hmm. a very orderly uh, progression or sequence of things. Um, the original ones had the, a heavy sheet that you could tear out. It was a one yeah. sheet. And I said, great, I can put all of Buddhism on one page, like the film for a disposable camera. Yeah. And everything else would be like how to develop it or like, you know, a disposable razor or something. They don't have, it's still in the back, but it's not a tear out. It's just, it's in the back of the book. So when I was proposing the book and it's hard, you know, to get a, a book deal, you always have to climb a mountain of, you know, I don't know what. And um, one of the things they always want to know is, you know, numbers, you know, they like the idea, but what about the numbers? And I was able to tell them, see, this was at a time when there wasn't a section on Eastern religion in the bookstores. Mm -hmm. It was new age where you could find crystals and UFOs and, right. you know, talking with dolphins and Buddhism all together. Yeah. Uh, alphabetical by author, you know? Yeah. And I was saying, no, Buddhism is starting to become, and I was giving them numbers about, you know, how many people were following it. And then I gave them for about the books. And this is interesting, I think, that this was a time when um, there were three technologies that came together, the portable tape recorder, word processing, and uh, transcriptions. Mm. machines and so when a holy man a buddhist would give a talk it was recorded somebody transcribed it and it was easy to then publish so shambhala published uh cutting through spiritual materialism by their leader their founder their teacher jogim trungpa rinpoche mm -hmm. and it was a big hit and then um i think the next was Thich Nhat han he had these talks that were transcribed and it was called um, Being Peace, or maybe just before that was the one of Sh Suzuki Roshi, where his talks were transcribed by 
uh, published by a small tea ceremony publishing company. It sold a million copies. Mm. <laughs> I kid you not. Yeah. Um, and there was something marvelous too about those that phenomenon because it was people talking rather than writing. So, but, but it had the numbers that I was able to give to the publisher and say, look, it sold six figures, it sold six figures, it sold six figures. And since that's what they, all they kind of think about is, you know, that, uh, okay. And they kind of estimated that my book might have a big market and they kind of gave it enough, you know, space. I um, love it. And, and then you've done three editions. How have those revision cycles been each time yeah. you've <laughs> done a revision on it? I don't want to talk about it. That's fine. I mean, I will if you just the nutshell is is that because the dummies would do an update, yeah, and they do a new revision. I had to do a revision. I love it. Isn't okay. the Buddhism had changed? Right, right exactly. That's but, so funny. But you know, I would update science with sure. new science, and you know, I'd find new things to do to update the book. Yeah, and I've uh, you know, I've explored that a little bit recently. Um, I had Dr. Ira Helderman on the show, mm. and he wrote. He's a, a neuroscientist. Right. He's a, yeah. a therapist, a psychotherapist, who writes about um, the like Bud using Buddhist methods in psychotherapy. And his right. book was tremendously interesting. And now there's all these labs all over the world that are exploring techniques and, uh, you know, right. trying to get some like scientific data out um, right. regarding, you know, things that are historically linked to Buddhist practice. So right. it's always changing and there's so much yeah. interest in it right now. And so I was looking at your book and I noticed that it seems in my perception you may disagree, which is fine, to be broken down into four parts. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the structure of oh, the sure. book, if you if you will. Um, part one is called Buddha Showing the Way. And I'm curious about the, the premise uh, of this first part. And if you uh, maybe if you agree with my assessment, assessment of it being a four part book. Gee, you're, you're great. I'm happy to answer the question and the question. <laughs> um, uh, I, uh, respectfully disagree from my point of view as a right, as the writer of it, because I see the book as a twofer. Okay. And it's, uh, two parts. The first part's in three and the three are Buddha, Dharma, the Buddha's teachings, Sangha, a community of people practicing the teachings. I love it. And that's three. And then the fourth is an all other book. And so I call the first part uh, living Buddhism. Live it, you know, it's alive in the present moment. This is living Buddhism, it's the teachings of the Buddha. And then the second part is Buddhist living, I, you could say. And it's applications in uh, your relations, in, in meals, at work, uh, popular culture, high culture, science. And it ends with uh, engagement, meaning. Uh, social, social, political, environmental engagement in the world in action. So to answer your question, <laughs> the Buddha, you know, is this historical figure um, that um, is the first chapter, the biography of how a man awoke. And awoke is what Buddha means, Bud, to awaken to be awakened or to awaken. And this guy, this fabulous guy, this um, incredible human being um, is worth looking at, I think, in and of himself, because he's like, you know, uh, whether or not you agree with Einstein or Freud, um, he's just opened doors. It's like the Wright brothers when they flew, mm we still use their basic calculations. Mm. It's like when one human being makes this breakthrough, right? It can lift everybody up by the bootstraps to another level or quantum leap or whatever. So there's the biography, which itself is a teaching, is full of teachings in, the, in his story. And then a chapter on how his teaching spread from country to country, from region to region. And as that boat docked, took on, it docked at the various shores of countries. 
it took on the flavors and the culture and the um, views and traditions of each native country because it isn't a, a, a top-down kind of a proposition. It's very much see for yourself. And so as each country learned the teachings of the Buddha, Buddhism took on the various different um, aspects of those countries. And then there's a chapter on um, how all this comes to the West, mm. which is what we started out at in some length because it's a really interesting phenomenon. Um, I think I called it the first opening of a petal of the lotus in a thousand years. Yeah, well, and I really liked that section. Um, oh, the newest you. petal of the lotus, yeah. Western Buddhism. Yeah. And, you know, the book came out in 2009. And, you know, we, we've talked a lot about how, uh, you know, Buddhism has grown from place to place over the years and how the different vehicles of Buddhism, um, you know, sort of took root in different parts of the world. Right. And then you ended on that last comment with this newest pedal in the West. And yes. here we are. Here we are. And, you know, the book came out in 2009. And I'm wondering what stands out to you about the ongoing and continued growth of Western Buddhism hmm. over the past several decades. Because as you mentioned, context matters. So, What's special about this Western Buddhism tradition that is still growing um, seemingly very quickly? Wow, great question. Um, I, I would answer maybe surprisingly, maybe not. Um, uh, and just kind of navigating through this landscape of I don't know if Buddhism grows, <laughs> you know, it just is what it is. And more and more people um, go, hmm, yeah, I, I, I get that. And hmm, yeah, maybe I'd like to try that. And you get more population of people who are interested in it. And I, if there was just one thing that I could say since I wrote the book that is really prominent now, is that what you're asking? Yeah is uh, mindfulness. Mm. And I'll, I mentioned this in the book a little, you know, that, you know, you know mindfulness is making progress in inroads. And that was way before it really started to took, take off. And I have, um, um, actually, that's what my latest book is, is to ground mindfulness in its Buddhist roots. Is a kind of a recovery, a reconnaissance, um, since, uh, although uh, uh, much of mindfulness is valuable, it's, it, it gets hard to tell which is mindful and which is kind of hype and buzz. Right. Well, and it's uh, the, the secularization hijacking of mindfulness seems to um, be a big problem. Well, you know, it's, that's not the problem so much for me. I hear you. Yeah. As the, as the denaturing. Mm, interesting. You know, that it's just like, can you take the flower out of the soil and put it in a pot when it communicated with these other flowers? It's like yoga, you know, do you, sure. do you just practice your asana in your Luluman outfit without knowing the uh, niyamas, which are the ethics and the, um, say, Advaita non-dualist philosophy? Because that's what yoga was designed to help you understand. Mm. <laughs> so similar, that's denaturing, you know, when you take it out of its roots. Right. Um, so not to lose my train, I'd like to offer, I don't think I've ever mentioned this to anybody <laughs> except to John Kabat-Zinn. And I don't hey, know. Nice. He, it was in a letter and he never, he never, he just said he liked my calligraphy, but he never answered this letter and it was just a point in the letter where i said you know it must be really hard you must be like freud i was giving him credit you know this guy's a real pioneer pioneering figure in bringing um mindfulness to so many people around the world yeah in china in italy just everywhere and he had studied zen and he had studied with Thich Nhat han and he's you know not 
doing it out of it mentally in, a, in an intellectual way. He's very grounded in this tradition. But as you say, very secular. And I said, I wonder if you are keeping it secular is like Freud. Because, you know, when Freud was given the doctorate, they said, be very careful, Herr Freud, because, you know, you're a Jew. Mm. We're giving a doctorate to you. And, you know, just look out the window at the time. And, you know, there were times when his patients couldn't come. He, he had to cancel because they people, Jews would get stoned on the streets in those days. Mm hmm. You know, so Freud took, well, I, I guess I got ahead of myself. Freud took Jewish mysticism and brought it to, through an upper class clientele, the masses in an interesting way. Dream interpretation coming from Kabbalah and the Talmud. You know, there's a whole, it, I'm not saying that all of psychiatry is Judaism, but I'm saying there's a strong Jewish element in Freudian psychology, and he had to toe the line. So it isn't until the end when he's talking about Moses and monotheism where you start hearing it. Similarly, I said, you know, to Dr. Kabat-Zinn, you must be like Freud, you know, not wanting because you you know you said it's Buddhism, but it isn't Buddhism, <laughs> right? <know? laughs> and that that's what they have to do because you can't teach mindfulness in schools in certain places where they'll say Buddhism in school is not allowed. That's you know that's a violation of uh, the, our amendment, and uh, you get in, you get in trouble with. Uh, fundamentalists and you know all all sorts of issues mm. and if you just say look we're we're bridging through psychology and science to things that we know and are finding like you're saying dr helderman is is working on that are beneficial and just you know don't talk about the buddhism mm. well let's that's talk what's about... made it very popular yeah so it's like to just for me to complete this sentence it's like if Buddhism is religion without religion, because there's no God, it's mm. the religion of no religion. It's up to you if you want to bring God into the question or not. Then mindfulness is kind of like Buddhism without the Buddhism. <laughs> interesting. I'm being I'm being analogical. I'm, yeah, this yeah. Is not literal. Right? No, no, no. It's very interesting. I, I, I like, think I, I like see it. it as a Buddhist phenomenon myself because my bring it back to me. My teacher Chick Nhat Han was talking about mindfulness. See, here's a funny thing. If you're a nerd, you'd like. <laughs> he wrote a book called The Miracle of Awakening as a handbook of meditation. And the publisher, the Unitarians, Beacon, changed the title. And they changed it to The Miracle of Mindfulness. Mm. And that's the mean carrier for mindfulness when he was teaching Buddhist meditation. And now when I hear mindfulness, I always have to go, are you talking about mindfulness that includes a philosophy and an ethical tradition of practice? Or are you talking you know, as, a, as a Buddhist way? Or are you talking about mindfulness as a um, psychological, scientific, science, Western science-based uh, practice, which is very valuable in and of itself? Right. Mm, interesting. Um, so, yeah, I mean, to answer your question, I think it's because Buddhism came to a very evolved country. It was, America was already evolved. Western civilization was highly evolved. When we heard the teachings of the Buddha, it's now we're dealing with how psychology and science, the, psych, the neuroscience are encountering Buddhism. And for the time being, you know, this mindfulness phenomenon has lots of interesting, wonderful potentials. And I also think it's important to kind of watch your step if you get serious about it, to understand what it is, where it comes from, and to see maybe if you want to take it further and, and include it as a Buddhist practice as well.
Yeah. Well, and earlier you mentioned schools and mindfulness as well. And some of the things that I always have been, that I've been fortunate to do is to talk about these traditions with, with teenagers for the first time, basically in their entire lives, like in a world religions class, you're often learning about this stuff for the first time. And, you know, I, I saw a section of your, of your book, the Dharma section, but I, in which you outline in accessible ways uh, many introductory Buddhist teachings, including something like the Eightfold Path, which I would often do my best to talk about with students and give them the ways that it would look in everyday life. Yeah. Um, if they were to like go outside after learning what the Eightfold Path is, like, can you notice right. it? in right. your own behaviors in the Can world you put the pedal to the metal and uh, exactly and clutch right yeah so so i see your dharma section in the book with the eightfold path being very tied to your buddhism and action applications and everyday life section of the book like i see these two as two parts that are working together in the book and so if i came if i invited you to talk as a guest speaker with my high school seniors um you know, they, you could imagine that they already know what the Eightfold Path is, like right view, thought, speech, action, work, effort, mindfulness, and concentration. What might you say to elevate the students who are a bright and curious bunch mm-hmm. into understanding these ideas within real lived life outside of a classroom with a teacher giving a lecture or something like that? Like, how yeah. would you show them that this is like in, something that can be applied into everyday living without like, right. you know, Obviously, it's First Amendment, freedom of religion sure, kind of balancing sure. act. But, you know, how would you talk to them about that as like an everyday life philosophy, guiding philosophy? Well, um, gosh, thank you. Uh, I've never uh, done this. for. In, uh, recently, I did it 10 years ago to 100 students. And I'll tell you, you've got it. You've got the audience. I mm-hmm. mean, they're there. They're yeah. they're already there. And if you explain, <laughs> just a little caveat that, like, you know, if you're an atheist, you can be an atheist. If you're a Christian, it doesn't. You can. You don't have to convert. You can. You can. It's. It's just. It's an additive uh, thing, or you know, practice. Then you know, once you've kind of given it permission and made it safe, what I would do is I would begin with, say, rather than my talk about it and be a sage on the stage, for a few minutes, I'd like to be a guide on the side and let Mm. you experience it for yourself and see for yourself, because that is the nature of Buddhism. So I'll invite a bell, you know, and, um, you know, in school, it's easy to do because you have bells and say, you know, here's one, but after I, you know, after we enjoy this bell meditation, throughout the day, whenever you hear a bell in school, what if you just stopped and noticed if you were reviewing the past or rehearsing the future and, and just stopped and returned to the present moment and took three conscious breaths and see if you would find that it makes your day less stressful mm. and you're able to concentrate more and um, it gives you a better sense of your intention throughout the day like I'm here to, because I want to be a brain surgeon or I'm here because you know I want to be a leader or whatever and so you can renew you know your actions by basing it in a kind of what you might call a meditative uh, practice you know, if you don't have mindfulness in the schools, this is essentially what I'm, how I'm kind of presenting this. And then I, um, you know, ex- in explaining that this is, the, these are all things you see for yourself and you have to put them into action in order for them to be real, to see if they're real for you. And if they are, then by all means do them. Um, then I might talk about these applications that you, you know, have uh, mentioned. It's in the second half of the book. Uh, you know, you know, you're going to have a relationship with friends. You know, uh, and you want to have lasting relationships. There's a lot that Buddhism can tell us about. You know, what is um, going to be beneficial and what might be harmful. 
uh, from cradle to grave. There's a whole chapter on that. And, um, you know, at lunch hour, if you want to have a mindful meal with a bunch of friends, you know, maybe Gregory will join you and you'll have a better sense of what it's like to be with your food rather than eating your anxiety or texting while you're eating and just being with food as meditation, as, you know, sustaining your connection, this, being with the sustaining connection of the universe mm. through food that nourishes you literally. Um, you know, I could name these chapters as I did before, you know, livelihood, you know, is when you're thinking about your career, if you are yet, or when you do, you know, there are certain things in Buddhism about livelihood that are teachings that you'll be able to perhaps enhance and fulfill your uh, potentials, your backgrounds, your aspirations, and so forth. Um, I don't know. That's yeah. Well, <laughs> kind of livelihood. You asked me, and on the wing, that's sort of what I would say right off the bat yeah well and livelihood is actually one of the students favorite ones to talk about um right. and i talked about this a lot with uh eric repair when he was on the show about because he's a, a chef oh. and he would like prepare seafood and wow. in order for somebody to own a restaurant oftentimes there is killing that is involved with food and animals and things that are served on plates. There's a lot yeah. of death involved. Yeah. So the right livelihood is such an interesting one to talk about with teenagers because yeah. they're always like, oh, I wonder if my profession is going to bring harm into the world in some way. And wow. am I helping people with, with this harm that is a, a sort of like a a, a, a consequence of certain actions, like how much can I weigh the cost benefit of the harm versus right, the yeah, good that right, I'm doing. Right, right. <laughs> and it's just a tremendously fascinating philosophical path to go down with young people who are on their career trajectory right, as right, right, right. people who are about to graduate from high school. It's one of my favorite things to talk about with that, with the students. Uh, I'm, a, I'm very inspired myself to hear that because you know, when I was uh, their age, that those questions weren't necessarily in the forefront of our consciousness at all. Right. Um, and and that is basically what quote unquote Buddhism is is the questioning. Yeah. You know, the Buddha didn't see a, never saw a light bulb. <laughs> you know, yeah, they're you know putting you know these basics of whether it's Judaism or or Islam or you know the fundamentals of what is the appropriate laws of nature um, to um, the modern world in our daily lives because we live in a society where we spend half of our time at work. This is a this is an area where Buddhism is really interesting. Just to kind of circle back uh, just to five minutes ago, mindfulness began in education. No, it began in health. It began in the hospitals and healing, then in education, and now it's reaching a new level in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And you have people like at Ford and Salesforce and the list goes on about people who are aware that mindfulness in the workplace is a very important uh, aspect, not just of performing better, but, you know, um, having a better livelihood. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, how can, how can we work together for a better world? Absolutely. Um, so when, what I would say at this point is that, you know, you could point out to the, your students, that they're asking not only the questions the Buddha asked, you know, it's like, well, did I kill the animal? If I didn't kill the animal, is it okay? Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm not the butcher and, you know, and you're saying the, the cost benefits and wing, that this questioning is the path. <laughs> There's no ultimate goal to it. It's the, the path of questioning is, is what's desirable and that they're going out into a world in which this questioning is pretty much for the first time that I can remember 
is being asked by the people that will be hiring them and that, mm-hmm. or that they'll be working with to create their own companies. Yeah. That this is indeed the, 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 the great, one of the great promises of Buddhism if we want to talk about, you know, sustainable economy, Buddhist mm-hmm. economics, or, you know, sustainable uh, ecology uh, in terms of how, how does our livelihood affect the ecosphere? Absolutely. So this is just is so on, this is so on the dime. Yeah, I love it. It's it's one of my favorite things to talk about with them. And they love it too, because they're like, oh, we're going to be going to college or we're going into the workforce and we have one chance at living a good life. And do we want to be like 85 years old someday and being like, well, I did nothing but harm the entire universe, the entire planet, my entire life. Gosh. Because th- and they they care about stuff like that, um, and young people uh, consistently inspire me because they ask questions like that, and I'm like, well, holy moly, I'm learning from you now. This is wonderful. But you know, Gary, we're talking in this weirdest of years. It's December 29th, <laughs> 2020, so we're in the yeah. tail end of the weirdest yeah. year. Uh, yeah. And you know, I'm curious how this year has impacted your practice, your writing, or any other aspect of your life that you are feeling particularly reflective about as we, you know, bear down on New Year's Eve here? Yeah. Um, Well, thank you for yet another great question, Greg. I, what comes to mind are two things. Um, One, is the enormity of what you asked, or what you're asked, of what we're asking. Um, I don't believe a single individual is capable. I absolutely don't believe a single individual is capable of grasping the enormity of the uh, amount of awareness of suffering. Mm -hmm. There may not be more suffering, I mean, a million people have died. More. S- more uh, two million people, 1.7, right? As of this recording. Um, oh, yeah, 1.79. I'm looking at it right now. Yeah. And my feeling about that phenomena is that I, it's, I feel it. <laughs> I can't help it. It's like if you cut off my arm, that's like that, that isn't even 1.7 million people. I think as a species, as human living beings, the enormity of this is just too hard to fathom every day. It really is. And it brings to mind the third part. I don't know if we get to it now in this program, but there's Buddha, there's the teachings, and there's a community of practice. Right. And that it takes a community to be able to deal with the enormity so that we don't you know, go berserk or break down or, um, you know, become, it become just mentally unhealthy in dealing with this great, it's essentially a health issue, issue of health, and which is synonymous with wholeness and, and um, holiness. So there's that. It's just, it, it weighs, it, I don't know, it weighs. It's just, I'm, vol- it opened my, my heart's been broken every day since March. And, mm-hmm. and in, in Judaism, there's a saying, you know, that when your heart is broken, you, it, your heart, your heart broken open. You know, the, the, the idea of vulnerability is good. It is not like, oh, I'm enlightened and I'm above all this stuff. Well, I don't know what enlightenment is if you're not a human and vulnerable to what's going on right now, which is in fa- unfathomable in its, its, its immensity. And so I'm just very um, um, grateful for the small and the large contacts I have with individuals and groups during this time, because mm-hmm. I know this is not necessarily going to end in a way we're going to come back to the normal that we knew mm-hmm. that we are in effect creating a new world and I can't create it alone. <laughs> you know? yeah. None of us can. So the, the issue of, of building community has become very, you know, strong 
even at the level of neighbors that you see every day with, uh, and your family and your friends, if uh, God willing, you still have them all. Mm -hmm. And um, the other thing that comes up for me that has come up consistently that I've noted is something called equanimity, which isn't, um, again, it's not like an enlightened stance that, um, you know, you know, spiritual by bypassing, it's where you use spirituality to kind of avoid dealing with oh, interesting. real stuff. It's called spiritual bypassing. Equanimity is not like, oh, it's all one, everything's equal, or it, it sounds like that, but it's not. It's really an engaged way of living a sincerely um, spiritual life, recognizing everything for what it is. That's more of a definition of equanimity. Um, recognize, and it, in doing that, it's a recognition that reality is boundless, mm. that I don't know. It's more than I can, it's more than, again, it's more than I can imagine, much less think through. Yeah. And, and to um, encounter everyday life from a place of equanimity, of not adding to it and not diminishing it, but just kind of head on seeing each person and instance and encounter as it is, mm -hmm. just so like this, um, and recognizing the suffering and recognizing the potentiality for liberation from suffering beyond the pain of these times is what's keeping me uh, through. It's like, um, it's like a balance is another way of looking at it. Um, where in this, you know, the scales of, on the one hand, having a practice, being grounded in a spiritual commitment, as, you know, as a, as a full human being, say, and yet always being ready to leap into the fray of the emergency if it calls. So on the one hand, I'm, you know, perfectly calm, happy, centered, and yet at a moment's notice, ready to dive into the full catastrophe, as yeah. Kazan Zaki said. And on the other hand, in the middle of the full catastrophe, being at least the one, if not one of others, who is maintaining that sense of humanity, mm -hmm. that um, kind of stillness in the center of the cyclone. So it's, you know, are you, meditating in an emergency and also being ready for an emergency in the middle of a meditation. <laughs> to me, that's kind of like if I were to verbalize how I'm, how I'm making it, how yeah. I'm getting through these times, man. Uh, I would say equanimity. I'm curious if there are any sanghas around anywhere in the world that you've communicate with who are like inspiring you on the way they are handling things in keeping everybody engaged? Like, have you noticed like any adjustments in sanghas around the world that you're in touch with that, you know, have adjusted to, uh, in, in, in positive ways? Um, that's a, a question that I can answer obliquely in a way that you might not expect. Okay, go for it. <laughs> um, I just kind of open our eyes to the fact that um, we've been um, suddenly immersed in, as we're doing now, digital culture. That is, sanghas around the world are now available to anybody. Catholic masses, Jewish chavurs, you know, chavuras, Islamic prayer groups, whatever it is, we now have the, the capability of 
connecting with those communities without having to leave our homes. Mm -hmm. And yes, I think all of them are in their own way. Finding, you know, each per in my experiences as, as a Buddhist, I haven't heard anybody give a, a talk yet that says, this is about the pandemic. This is my talk about the pandemic. And yet every talk I hear, it's, it's obvious that the person is talking about ancestors or equanimity or uh, loving kindness or whatever it is in light of the present moment. So my answer kind of is, is that I'm noticing that now I can uh, connect with the Magnolia Grove Monastery and the Deer Park Monastery. One is in Alabama and one is in Southern California mm -hmm. where monastics are offering their teachings about or within these times uh, to anybody uh, around the world. And I take just refuge in that fact in and of itself. Yeah. Rather than any particular teachings that I've heard that I went, oh, wow, that was really cool. Because I have, but to me, this, this, larger phenomenon is just astonishing mm. how do you see the how do you see buddhist practice changing in like the post-pandemic world do you think that there will be any shifting priorities or anything like that as we move through the vaccination process into the whatever comes next mm. well along with this virtual community mm -hmm. i think uh engagement be, will is and will become more and more um, an encounter of Buddhism with modernity up to this present moment of, of post-vaccination, if you will, mm -hmm. where we still have economic dislocation. Um, we have a polarized country nationally, which... God willing, won't be a civil war, but still we have large numbers of people who, you know, like they don't want to be vaccinated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that, that the, the pandemic kind of revealed besides, you know, uh, the, the, the healthcare issues, um, the nature of our community and communities. And how can we build communities together? I would love if there were um, Republican and Democrat listening circles the way there are with Israelis and Palestinians. Mm. Yeah, almost um, like a truth and reconciliation. Absolutely. Uh, before there was the Buddhist Peace Fellowship, it was part of something called the the the. the the Fellowship of Reconciliation, which, you know, is like just about the, at the beginning of the Vietnam War. And I think that concept of reconciliation, you know, it's, it's not a matter of um, if I, you know, it's, if I kill humans, <laughs> then with whom am I going to live? Mm. Mm. You know, That's how are we going to live together? How are we going to live together? is I think a, a tremendous challenge that um, Buddhism is is um, capable of, if you will. Yeah, yeah, I could see it for sure. Um, and also just to dot an I or cross a T and this aspiration that you and I are both kind of, you know, listening to. Sure. I would love it if it could also become like a level playing field, like an honest broker, if you will. Yeah for you know uh christian islamic jewish dialogue um and the various other kinds of dialogues that i think we are going to have that we're having and that we're going to have whether or not people are hearing each other yeah well you know i kind of want to bring us in for a a nice peaceful landing 
Um, and I want to talk about something else for just a few minutes that I know sure. that you're very, very engaged with, and that's the writing of haiku. Oh, uh, I know you're very committed to writing haiku. And okay, let's you... let's 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 say the word one, two, three. Haiku. Uh, haiku. Gesundheit. Interesting. Excellent. Okay. Haiku. Um, yeah, and I know that you've taught haiku. Well, <laughs> I don't know if haiku can be taught, but I've, you know, been a guide on the side. Excellent. Well, you know, what? what is, uh, do you have an exercise that you might suggest to folks listening oh. who may be interested in dabbling in haiku? And if there's anything that you could, you know, give a tip to for some possible beginners who may be oh. interested in trying something new. Oh, okay. This is, uh, this is good because it kind of brings Buddhism into a little teacup, <laughs> <laughs> something, you know, small and it contains the whole universe haiku. Um, when you uh, go out and come home, um, sit down and write down all the sense impressions that you can recall. Um, fleecy clouds, icy snow, um, uh, exhaust of cars. Just make a list of all the things you remember. Actually, I'll go back a step. Start with a notebook, you know, keep a notebook um, and a pencil because you might want to erase. And um, start making lists. Um, and when you're out in the world and you notice um, mm, self-absorbed jogger, um, newborn bird hopping from park bench to park bench, mm. just these little things that you see Practice saying what you see in, in just little, like on recipe cards, very small. And when you have enough, then mm, get some recipe cards or pieces of paper, little piece of paper to write down some seasonal um, signposts. It could just be um, middle of winter, winter solstice, great conjunction, um, dead of winter, early spring, end of winter, and see if you can match up uh, one of those with one of the sense perceptions that you have in your list. Like, um, well, one, I, and, and see if also you notice them in your own awareness. Uh, like the one that I saw this week that's really obvious <laughs> <laughs> you haven't already, is um, dead of winter. Zoom, I'm sorry. Dead of winter, I freeze in Zoom meeting. <laughs> dead of winter, I freeze in Zoom meeting. Um, those are people haiku, but you know, whether it's human nature or nature, especially this time of year, it's like a fifth season. Just this intensity of like these two weeks, but throughout the, the seasons, notice the change of seasons and notice little things that you kind of match up with the season, like um, early spring, newborn bird hopping from park bench to park bench, or you might put the seasonal word after Newborn bird hopping from park bench to park bench, early spring. Mm. And just, it's like, it because they're so small, the units are so small. You can practice going around and around and editing. Do you say the bird, a bird, this bird, bird? And just keep, when you find one that seems to match, just then play with it for that day. Um, and the last, I guess, part of this is, if you notice two things that kind of go together, write them both down at the same time. 
And you may just write down the two little parts of it before it kind of evolves into a whole haiku. Um, keep it simple, K-I-S. I love it. Nothing special. <laughs> That's so cool. I feel like I want to set myself a, a goal now just to write one every day with uh, no expectation on the quality whatsoever. Just oh, have it down. So no expectation means it's Zen because we have no agenda. We have no intention. <laughs> We're just being here, right? We're not trying to write a sonnet. We're not trying to do anything. And I'll also say that I'm when I teach, I say haiku is a noun, a verb, an adjective. You see haiku, you write haiku, you read haiku. When you read a haiku, old pond, frog flies into, it takes the reader for that haiku to take place in the, in the mind. Mm -hmm. um, so practice, haiku is a practice of awareness. It's a practice of being in the present moment in a creative, receptive way that when you want, you have the aspiration for it and you have the pad for it and the pencil, see how many times the universe is haikuing. Mm. And you go, oh, haiku. I love it. It's almost like a language of how to walk down the street. <laughs> Fantastic. Who, Gary... would, who would not walk down the street with tigers when every corner is a compromise. Mm. Gary, do you have a haiku or a haiku? I just you, did. No, well, a haiku. That you, um, that you want to leave us on? I'll leave you with a haiku. Full moon. Scooping it up in a bucket. I spilled it across the grass. Gary, where can Full people mm. <laughs> where can uh where can people find you if they want to follow you, get in touch, know more about your work? Um GaryGock.com. I got an update. Um adding some meditations and stuff that I'm recorded or and I am recording. Uh, Gary .gock. I'm sorry, Gary. I'm learning how to pronounce it. Gary.gach at gmail. Uh, and the phone number's in the book. Awesome. Well, Gary, I am delighted that you're able to spend uh, such a substantial portion of your day with me. Um, we had a, we had this a long time coming. Long time coming. In our scheduling. And so I was... Uh, I had so many things to talk to you about, and I'm glad that we had the uh, the time and the space and the energy to follow so many different threads of your work across so many years in uh, kind of like a deluxe bonus extra length long episode of Classical Ideas. I think we did a, I think we had a, I had a really nice time and I hope you did too. I didn't look at the clock until you mentioned it. It's been a privilege, a pleasure and a heavenly delight to cover so much wonderful ground with you, Gregory. <laughs>